In the Emerald Isle, something unexplainable is happening. Tonight, prepare to witness the most frightening event in horror podcast history. A journey into the depths of horror history. First Class Horror presents The Class Horror Cast. Evil wears many masks, but pure horror wears only one. Support First Class Horror on Patreon for as little as one dollar. Can't get enough of the horror? Carve yourself a deal from official merchandise only on Teespring. Join us on all social media at First Class Horror. We have such sights to show you. Patrick Lussier started his career as an editor for TV series such as 21 Jump Street and MacGyver. This was all before forming a relationship with the horror master Wes Craven. Patrick would play a pivotal role in movies such as New Nightmare, Scream 1, 2 and 3 and Red Eye. He is also credited by director Steve Miner as a driving force behind the fan favourite Halloween H2O. His first taste of directing came in The Prophecy Tree, The Ascent, with Christopher Walken. From there he would tackle the character of Dracula with his Dracula 2000 movie, which spawned two sequels. While still editing and working on huge projects, Patrick managed to mine gold with 3D slasher flick My Bloody Valentine in 2009. Since then he has worked with Nicolas Cage in Drive Angry 3D and then released his own movie Trick in 2019. He is one of the masters of the genre and has been at the centre of some of the most iconic movies of all time. We got to chat about his career from the start, some advice for creatives, his favourite horror movies and he even gives us an exclusive look at the opening scene of his proposed sequel to My Bloody Valentine. You really don't want to miss this chat. I hope you all enjoy this as much as I did. Okay, so can you remember the first horror movie or horror related experience maybe that you might have had? Uh, Yeah, Uh, a few um, actually. I guess one of the first ones was uh, the opening voodoo scenes from Live and Let Die, uh, which I found to be terrifying as a kid, as I never was allowed to see the whole movie. Just the opening mm-hmm. when everybody dies and then and it was off to bed. Uh, <laughs> um, uh, and then uh, my sister telling me in detail the story of The Exorcist after she had seen it. She's older. I had not seen it, but she she... She narrated The Exorcist for me, which was terrifying, um, the way she told it. And, uh, and then probably the uh, uh, early days of watching things like uh, Night Gallery, Rod Serling's mm-hmm. Night Gallery, which was very terrifying. And other, I think there was one with a, an earwig crawling across somebody's brain and through one ear and other laying eggs across. Um, uh, there was one with a class of students who, who was Vincent Price, who, uh, are, one has to shoot the other and there's a sort of a whole moral dilemma. And, mm-hmm. and, and, and then finally, uh, he refused to do it. I think it was the guy from emergency, Richard Matthew. And, uh, and, uh, somebody else comes up and shoots him and you reveal, oh my God, they're all robots. The whole class. I think I think it was called the class of 1999 or something. Mm-hmm. Uh, that segment of that, uh, but yeah, those those very much stuck with me. And would uh, you say from that point did you become uh, fascinated with with scary movies or horror, or did you go the other way and you were kind of terrified? I uh, I was terrified, but drawn to it, but fascinated by it. You know, it was the it was the forbidden fruit that you're like, oh my god, I I I I, I can't look, but I can't not look. Yeah, uh, yeah, yeah, I guess that, that sort of thing. You know, watching like that, and uh, uh, I remember watching it on old, old horror horror movies on an old TV that uh, was in the house, and 
and you know flicking the channels in between and then flicking them back when you thought you were brave enough to to continue yeah. um you know uh, there was clearly no remote control for it <laughs> did um uh, did that carry you through then into your teenage years and stuff did it just get more and more yeah yeah i think it did and then uh i started reading you know i was always an avid reader so um mm-hmm. My sister had given me uh, Salem's Lot, uh, the Stephen King book, and that really solidified it. I loved that book and then started reading everything that Stephen King wrote and then finding other sort of authors in the genre who mm-hmm. saw, you know, some comparable, many not so good, but read them anyways. And uh, that became uh, very much uh, something I was, uh, those stories I was very much drawn to. And would you say that started your um, maybe journey into f- filmmaking or w- or wanting to write movies, direct movies? Um, you know, weirdly enough, what actually started me wanting to, to get into the movie business was uh, seeing Star Wars. Uh, because um, Star Wars uh, had so many uh, TV specials and stuff about how it was made. Mm-hmm. It was understanding that you mean I love this thing, and there's actually a job where you get to make this thing. Yeah, um, I know how do how do how do I get that job? Um, so that very much became my focus as of about 1977 after seeing Star Wars, and then you know started learning so much about how movies were made, mm-hmm. uh, any kind of movie, and then uh, really got into the working in the genre after. Um, meeting and working with uh, Wes Craven on uh, a TV show called uh, Nightmare Cafe, which lasted like six episodes in, in 91, 92. Mm-hmm. Um, so I think it was shot in 91 and released in 92. Uh, but that that pretty much uh, uh, made me realize that that's what I wanted to get into. And did you have a vision for which aspect of the business you wanted to be in? Did you have a goal? of? Uh, uh, yeah, I always did love the act of storytelling. You know, I started as a film editor. I was a mm-hmm. film editor on MacGyver for years. Uh, you know, I edited for Wes Craven for almost 20 years on a variety of different projects. And um, um, I love that storytelling part of it. And, you mm-hmm. know, there ended up being a lot of sort of uh, impromptu writing that would go into that. So, you know, I always sort of dabbled in writing. So I would start doing that more, certainly um, in how things could be restructured and reworked. Um, uh, and then always wanted to direct, but, you know, you sort of keep that quiet because, you know, every, every, uh, fan in there, <laughs> you know, running around, ah, I'm going to direct my own movie and one day mm-hmm. it's going to be amazing. Um, that's not an invitation of any fan specifically <laughs> 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 or all of them. <laughs> um, but yeah, it's, uh, you know, uh, sort of kept that quiet until there was an opportunity to do it and then uh, seized it. That that must have been crazy, a crazy ride with, with Wes and stuff. Like, I mean, you guys made some incredible movies together. And, like, they seem to, at least in my opinion, they've like they've gotten more and more popular as time has gone on. And they're these, like, iconic... Like how was yeah. that at the time? Did did it feel like that at the time? You know, of Scream no, and all these have, different you movies. Have, you have no understanding that you know, certainly with the first one, you don't you don't go in thinking, Oh yeah, this is it, this is an iconic mm. thing. This will live on long beyond us and, and you don't think that at all. You just think, um, you know, every day how do how do I do the best work possible? Uh, to contribute, you know, the uh, the best of my craft to this particular project, and and you know, you embrace it with all that uh, enthusiasm and passion, and and you do that to each one. Sometimes they're good, sometimes they're not, uh, and they're and are long forgotten. But um, but you know, Scream, it was it was a great screenplay that Kevin wrote, and. Uh, uh, and Wes shot it very much as a straight horror movie that had humor to it, as opposed mm-hmm. to a comedy that had some scares in it. And um, and 
it uh, really, when we previewed it for an audience the first time, we started getting the inkling that, oh, this is actually going to work really well. Yeah. Uh, you know, the, uh, the line of the, of, of the uh, ghost face on the phone uh, to Drew Barrymore, uh, you know, he says, you know, I want to know who I'm looking at. And, uh, mm -hmm. And, you know, 400 people just went, <gasps> yeah. and, I mean, and, and it was, you know, it was a real sort of uh, drum, you know, callback to Psycho, right? So the movie hadn't really done what Scream had done since Psycho, where you have that great opening mm -hmm. where you're following the main character and then you just, they're dead. Uh, and the point of view shifts, you know, this with Drew Barrymore, that opening was so, you were so engaged with her. And then it became so awful <laughs> as what happened to her, uh, you know, when she dies, um, you know, the very horrific. And and when we first screened it, when you meet Nev Campbell, people were positive we were going to kill her. When she's attacked yeah. in the house the first time, they're just like, OK, you're insane. And that was very much Wes's philosophy uh, on that film it's, and, and several of his movies is, is you have to make the audience think you're crazy and unsafe during the first 10, 15 minutes of the movie, make them think that there is no safe place for them to run so that they never trust anything you're going to do. Yeah, it's funny because it's like, it's like you guys managed to break the mold completely, but then kind of create this new mold of complete uncertainty. We've got, we don't know what the rules are. And then as you went, you know, we get into the second movie, it's like the rules are being rewritten. Yeah. yeah, and it's like, a, it's, yeah, it, it worked really, really well. Yeah, it, you know, there was a lot of very uh, clever people involved, you know. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, Wes, obviously, you know, first and foremost, and Kevin Williamson, and, and, and Julie Pleck, and and, uh, uh, and the cast, and everybody, uh, you know, everybody, uh, it was one of those things where everybody was rowing in the same direction. Yeah, uh, that's not always the case in movies. Uh, this very quickly, everybody realized that there was a common goal. Yeah, and you, and you can definitely tell. You you can feel that it was um, a passion project, probably first for most people. And I feel like your hmm. name, the, for me at least, anyway, uh, a huge slasher fan to start with. But I always feel like your name is one of those few names that when you look at a movie like that you know it's it's gonna do <laughs> i i've always found that you, your oh, your name well, and nice. there's maybe yeah, like five or six other people that seem to show up all the time in these movies that turn into gems really oh well that's that's nice of you to say it. yeah i i i'm not sure exactly why that is but i'll i'll take it <laughs> um, like yeah, even you you worked as the editor on halloween h2o right yeah, yeah, yeah. I cut the film, and and that was that was a uh, you know working with Steve Miner. It was a great experience. Steve would shoot very uh, little. He didn't shoot a lot of you know. Mm -hmm. We would average maybe ten fifteen minutes of dailies a day. Normally, you average anywhere from forty five minutes to an mm -hmm. hour and a half. Um, sometimes these days even more. But it was. Um, he shot, you know, there was no part of the animal was wasted. Everything, uh, except for a couple, two scenes, I think, is on screen. In the, and you can see those in the TV version because the movie was short. Uh, but it was just the lean movie that knew exactly what it was going to do. Um, uh, you know, the director's cut was, uh, director's cut normally have 10 weeks. The director's cut on, on Halloween H2O was a day and a half. Wow. Steve came into the cutting room for uh, one whole day and then halfway through the second day, I think before lunch, he uh, was like, well, that's me. All right. Good luck. Don't let him screw it up. And he was, you know, he came back for the mix. He, he was he was off to direct Lake Placid. Uh, we showed the studio the next day uh, and they had a half a day's worth of notes. So in post total, there was two days of cutting. Um, and we lock picture. Wow. Uh, and, and that's the movie that's released. I am. Uh, 
I know, like, it seems to be a very love or hate kind of movie. Now, I personally, that's one of my <laughs> favorite movies that I, that's in my, among some other movies that we'll probably get into in a minute, that's in my um, comfort movies. So if I'm having a bad oh, day or something yeah. is wrong, yeah, I, that's yeah. always a go-to for me. Um, yeah, that's fun. And I know some people don't, don't like the movie. I, there's a lot of stuff that went on... Um, with the different masks and stuff. Uh, yeah. Well, did, yeah, that was, that was a, that was a thing. Yeah. Did that become an issue uh, for you guys trying to put the movie together and maybe not mm-hmm. make it as noticeable or. Uh, sure. To a degree, you know, there, there was, you know, three or four different masks. Um, the good news was, is the mask problem was happening during the original shoot. Mm-hmm. So there was no, additional photography that we had to go back to do um the the masks themselves uh the whole end with uh with uh uh laurie strode in the cafeteria when the shape is flipping the tables and things like that that's all reshot the first version of that was with a different mask um uh and it was all it was like all the lights were on Mm-hmm. And then uh, um, before they finished shooting that location, it, it was handed down, we're going to go back and reshoot that. Um, so at that point, uh, the new mask showed up, uh, the Stan Winston mask, uh, which is the bulk of the movie, and uh, with its gorgeous hair. Um, and uh, that scene was redone. Um, there's that one digital mask that, yeah. that the, the visual effects people were promised us would would be would be perfect and was total shit and uh and we all hated it but at the time it showed up um because they had pulled the release date so far forward Mm -hmm. you know originally we're coming out in in the end of september and suddenly we were coming out in august uh uh, because the movie had previewed so well so at that point we're like uh okay i think we would have been better going with the other mask or actually going back and just reshooting those two shots but because that digital thing was it's like oh look it's cartoon michael myers yeah. Uh, um yeah none of us were happy with that um but it it uh, there was no time because of the commitment to the release date their earlier release date you know it was just like well i guess we're riding with that one yeah it's uh, it's funny because I think nowadays people who love the movie because it has a huge following, uh, it's just kind of become like maybe the ugly duckling. People kind of laugh about it and go, you know what? It makes it a little bit quirky. It's a, it's another story. Yeah. Kind of. Yeah. What what was the actual reason or, or when did that start to happen? This, these changes of masks and. Oh, day one of photography. Oh, wow. um, the original white face mask that was very smooth um uh this they shot it early on uh, i think one of the first scenes shot was the was the scene in the rest stop with the little girl and, mm-hmm. and her, her mom um and there was just a hatred uh <laughs> of the mask um and then the director dug his heels in and there was debate back and forth and there was all sorts of drama and mm-hmm. um you know i we had had similar mask issues on the beginning of screen um you know before the, the uh, that mask and you can even see in the opening in drew Barrymore sequence you can see there's different versions of the mask that mm-hmm. are used um so you know it was a battle that i was like oh yeah I've, I've heard i've heard this before uh so we'll just see what happens um and uh at the end of the day it's uh i think the winston mask is much better than the original mask that they started shooting with the the all white sort of smooth mask the 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 marshmallow mask um and i'm glad that turned out that way um you know there was a concern about doing too much of the william shatner mask because it had become so public that it was william shatner that there was yeah. there was fear of, of mr shatner showing up with his lawyers and 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 wanting a piece of the action um so you know that i don't think has ever happened but uh although one time we did 
uh, later years later pitch a version of, of Halloween and one of the many sequels that would have William Shatner in it, and where he would have a death scene where he reached out and and, and touched touch the mask lovingly <laughs> as he's touching his own face. But nobody went for it. We just thought it would be great. It's a uh... That, that just when you mentioned that, I, I've honestly always been surprised that there hadn't been an issue with yeah. It's so public, like, <laughs> and it's and it and and it's you know uh, it's, I guess it's a credit to, yeah. to Mr. Shatner that he's got very good humor about it. Uh, yeah. Or he signed away all his rights, uh, one or the other. Uh, um, because it's just like, dude, that's, you, you know, Captain Kirk is and Michael Myers. They're, mm-hmm. I, I, uh, I was always surprised forever. that there was nobody. I, I often thought maybe like, how is nobody on his team or whatever that works for him or with him said, yeah. we need to get a piece of something here because this There's is a, a huge... lot of lawyers in the world. So you yeah. you'd think that you'd think there'd be, you'd be a few of them that would be stepping up and knocking on the door. Yeah. Um, but, you know. Uh, I, I love the fact that it, that it exists that way and uh, and that we all know that's what it is. Yeah, it's another, it's one of those things like, and I think the, the horror community really appreciate all those. Um, that's why uh, conversations with people like yourself, I think, do really well because the community are so passionate. They want everything. They want to know everything. <laughs> they want to know, you know, how did this happen? How did you do this? All the behind the scenes. I think that's why... Now with Scream Factory and companies like that, when they re-release these collector's edition Blu-rays, mm. it does so well with the special features. Yeah. yeah. Because people there's, are there's so... great things yeah. on that. Yeah. Um, yeah. So that was in 98, 97, 98? 98. 98. That was, that. I think, started shooting in the end of February, 98, and was in theaters in August. It was a very quick... So that that was a couple of years before Dracula. Had yeah. had you was that already looming around at that point? Uh, uh, Dracula. Yeah. It it no Dracula didn't uh, turn up until I know ninety seven ninety eight. Uh, Dimension Films were talking about doing a Dracula movie. Mm-hmm. Uh, Richard Potter had been talking about it because of the uh, 97 would have been the 100th anniversary of the release of the book. Um, so it was in their brain. Um, and then they realized the title Dracula 2000 that they wanted to do. Um, uh, and uh, I think it was during uh, music of the heart, the shooting of Scream Three that we started talking about it. Mm-hmm. Uh, um, uh, I was cutting music of the heart, Scream Three. I was doing music editing on Ranger Games and trying to finish the the prophecy movie that I directed, the third prophecy movie, um, uh, all at the same time. Um, and uh, the, it had come up, come up with an idea for Dracula Two Thousand. So. We came up with an idea that essentially was about thieves stealing. Well, Van Helsing being hooked on Dracula's blood, mm-hmm. you know, he couldn't figure out how to kill him, um, and didn't really want to because he was living forever and, and was sort of an old junkie. Um, and thieves break into his domicile and steal Dracula's body to sell her mortality for a million bucks a dose. They were going to just milk him like a cow. Mm-hmm. Um, and Dracula, of course, once he wakes up, has different ideas. Um, the original concept was that, and it ended up, you know, the reason it went to New Orleans, you know, there's been all sorts of things written about that story-wise, which I've always found sort of bizarre because the real reason it went there, because we wanted, uh, like the Demeter, the airplane that they take the body in, uh, and they knew what they were stealing. In the, in the movie now, they are ignorant of what they say, but they have no idea what they're doing, which I think is dumb as shit. Yeah. Um, that particular story change we were forced to make, it's just like, oh, why? Anyways, it doesn't matter. Um, plane crashes in the, in the swamp. Uh you 
see uh, this weird person rise from from the muck, and it's sort of a writhing thing of they're covered in mosquitoes, and it's Dracula naked, covered in mosquitoes that just feed off them and then take off all the mosquitoes. And throughout the rest of the movie, there was all these little mosquito sequences mm-hmm. uh, where people were being bitten. And at the end of the of the movie, he is completely contaminated. Uh, like Mardi Gras, all these people then travel out. He has re and reconfigured the world in his own image uh, successfully. Uh, our version that we wanted to make, Dracula always won. Um, and then we made the movie we made. And you know what? I, I do actually, and, and this movie online, I think over the years has gotten, it's another one of those, I think that has a, a cult following and, and it gets a lot of love. Um, yeah, I, I, there's lots that lots I love about it. I don't mean to to, to 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 bag on it. My my I have such mixed feelings about it because the journey had such a strange route, and I yeah. know what it could have been, and in my mind should have been, and I know versus what it is. And I every time I see it, I see all the I yeah. I see it through the through the lens of the journey that got it there. Yeah, and. So when when the movie came out, did you did you feel sour about it, or it was like bittersweet? Kind of, you got this movie that was what it was, but you kept seeing all those things of like, you know, we should have done this or I should have. It was, it was both those. You know, it was uh, thrilled to have had the opportunity to make a movie to make a movie of that scale, even though the reports of what it cost online are are totally false. Um, it you know costs less than half that, but um, um, it it you know there's lots of things in it I really like. I, I think Jerry Butler, Gerard Butler, is a great Dracula. I mm-hmm. think uh, working with Christopher Plummer was wonderful, and you know the whole cast was great. Um, uh, you know I've worked with Omar Epps again in the last uh, couple of years, and and. Um, and Nathan Philly and I worked with a couple of times and, and it's, you know, there's so many things that I really uh, like and the takeaway from that film, but there are other things that I just go, uh, Oh, if only we could, uh, and, and why didn't we? And, 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 uh, there's certain, you know, I often say about the film, we, we wrote a better movie than we were allowed to shoot. We shot a better movie than we were, than we had time to cut. Mm-hmm. Uh, um, uh, uh, because uh, you know they, everything was so rushed on that film, yeah, and and you know we started developing it in post production. Like Nathan Fillion's character, we added in post completely. That all that whole sequence with him was 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 a reshoot, and we created that, and we, just because we needed something, and there's it, it was. Because of the, all the different sort of writers who came in to sort of meddle with it, and then uh, before we started shooting, and then while we were shooting, and all, all the there was so many ideas and, and things in it, and uh, things that were thrown out even even as we were about to shoot them, uh, because we were told we weren't allowed to shoot them. It was also in the, you know in the in the wake of the Columbine shootings mm-hmm. and. So there was a real backlash on violence and, and promoting R-rated movies. And so, you know, the Van Helsing's death was originally in the movie was originally quite different. And we were set to shoot it to be quite different. But the days we were, day we were supposed to shoot it, we were told we weren't allowed to do that. Wow, you know, we're like, crazy. absolutely, you cannot do that. You must stop. You have to, you know, and it is. So, oh, oh. Okay, so I guess we'll just throw them into the mirror and stuff them under the bed. Uh, and did you better. have, like, um, I don't know, going into a movie, do you have vague um, option B, option C in your head in case something like that does happen? You, or do you just do it on the you, fly? You do, but during that time it was it was to such an extreme. Yeah. Um, you know, it was, you know, every day it was some sort of, like, what we're doing what um and you know i remember peter powell the director of photography he did crouching tiger he said to me you know patrick if you want to if you want to walk away well i'll walk away with you and it's just kind of like you know the only way out of this is through we yeah. have to keep pushing through we you know i'm not gonna 
leave all these people in the lurch and, and everything like that. That's also my highly irresponsible uh, to do that. I appreciated Peter, you know, offering to, to the solidarity of it, but it just felt like, okay, we, ha- we, we have to keep trying to make the best version of this we can in the circumstances that we've been handed. Um, so that's what we did. You know, I, I, uh, I think there are you know, a lot of fun things in it. Mm-hmm. I love the fight scene with, uh, Omar Epps and John Lee Miller mm-hmm. in the parking garage. Uh, uh, I love a bunch of the stuff in the ending with, with all this sort of, uh, crazy Kung Fu <laughs> stuff running mm-hmm. around. We had a great stunt team, uh, Ken Quinn and Kuichi Sakamoto. Kuichi was one of the Power Rangers when he was a kid, uh, in the early, early Power Rangers days. And, and, you know, we did a lot of wire work. Some people said, oh, is that all inspired by The Matrix? It's like, no, it was all inspired, inspired by a movie called, um, uh, Chinese Ghost Story. Uh, okay. Troy Hark produced movie from uh 1987 uh and and also then after that Roddy used movie the bride with white hair which is how i got peter powell to shoot the movie because uh somebody gave me his phone number and i called him in hong kong because he had he had dp a bride with white hair he dp the killer for john woo and, and i uh, said uh, you don't know me but i'm a fan <laughs> would you come out and shoot this movie and he said absolutely got on the plane and we met in toronto that's crazy. So after that experience, then, um, how did you end up back in the conversation or did with the sequel? How did that? Um, it was funny. They wanted to do these two sort of, uh, well, one direct video sequel. And they wanted to make it about this character, Ufizi, which uh, Jason Scott Lee played. Um and Ufizi was a part of the original Dracula 2000. Okay. He was a character in it. He was somebody sent by the Vatican to, to chase after these thieves. There was a whole component of that. It was very different. Um, and we had been told to cut him out because he was, quote, unquote, too cool. And then when it came time, the real lure for the for the two little sequels was when when Dimension Films said to us, "We we want you to do them, and we want it to be about Ufi, you know Ufizi." And I was, I was like, "Oh, okay, that, that so yeah. that was the." And then when we when we wrote Dracula Two, which had a lot of elements of that we originally had in in, in Dracula Two Thousand. Um, although on a much, 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 much smaller scale, um, the movie was, was quite lean, uh, in its Romanian shoot, in Romanian shoot. Um, we said, Hey, we have an idea for this third one. Can we do a two for, you know, can we shoot two for one? So we'll, we'll, we won't have to, you know, we'll use the same cast and, or, or the mm-hmm. same principles in both movies and we'll, uh, and, and we'll just shoot it at the same time. We'll schedule it as one film. And they said yes. So that's how we got to do both those movies because, you know, the bulk of the third movie is shot before the second movie um, because we were, because it was going to get really cold when we started shooting. Right. So we wanted to shoot most of our exterior stuff first. So we were up in Transylvania mm-hmm. shooting and, and stuff and um, uh, the journey that uh, Ufiti and Luke go on. But uh, yeah, that's, that's how that happened. And it's funny because <clears throat> a lot of people, so like the first has this pretty big following and then the second people kind of, eh, they tend to kind of discredit. And then the third movie has a lot of love again and everybody's like, yeah, it's back to form. It's perfect. It's a great ending to the trilogy. Uh, I wish Dracula had been in it more. I wish this, I wish that. I wanted more from it. Yeah, we wanted more from it too, but it, but it was made, it was made... It, it, it it's it's like um, a short story of a movie yeah uh you know it's, here, here's a novella uh here's the ideas that we wanted to pursue i mean there's a bigger version of that script and more crazy vampire circus stuff in it it has uh, it has all these sort of weird military combat fights and, and crazy shit in it that we just couldn't afford to do um there was 
Joel Swisson, the producer and co-writer of those films, um, uh, with me, he and I had talked about, you know, well, maybe we just re-cut them in to one sort of bigger film and and we played around with that and and we're gonna sh- you know there's some things we could shoot to make that work and make it a little more from um from elizabeth diane neal's point of view and and ultimately nobody wanted to pay for that so we we didn't do that uh, but yeah yeah it's it's a it's a movie yet uh in yeah. my mind it's it's the it's promise of a movie uh, that could have been um but yeah, we had we had more stuff that we would have done with Roy Scheider, you know, had we been allowed. You know, we had Roy for one day for both movies. Um, uh, a great actor and and such a pro. And Rutger was a joy, and you know, and Stephen Billington, you know, the, the it was also great. And, uh, they were fun little movies, but but they were they were lean. Hey, them. It, it does kind of show your your determination and I guess perseverance because I've I've heard stories of people walk away for a lot less, and it seems like you kind of went through the ringer for your first few. <laughs> yeah, I, I, either that or I'm you know, painfully stupid, uh, and it's just a glutton for punishment. It's just like, all right, I'll just keep doing it. Uh, you know, it, I think part of that is coming from what they call you know below the line being you know, coming in an editorial background where, where it's just like, well, we have to make it work. We just have to keep going. Mm -hmm. Uh, you know, my bloody Valentine, when we, uh, did that film, uh, it was so, it was the early days of, of shooting native 3d. So shooting with 3d cameras Mm -hmm. and not poster. And, it was really hard to see the dailies to see what it looked like. We were shooting with two completely different camera systems that didn't speak to each other. The, the silicon imaging cameras where they are steady cam cameras, which were these tiny little 3d cameras and then these massive red camera, uh, rigs, which were like shooting with a refrigerator. Mm-hmm. I mean, they were huge. And, um, I remember Brian Pearson, the DP, saying to me one day, he says, I, and he was almost in tears. It's like, I don't know what we're shooting. I can't see it. I don't have a sense of it, it's, it's good or anything. And I was just like, it doesn't matter. We just have to keep going. The only way we'll ever get out of this is to keep going. <laughs> so that was, that was, I guess, has long been my idiotic philosophy. That uh, That movie is for me personally that's in my like top three favorite movies of all time oh i love that well, and, I, it's, yeah it's my favorite film that i've, that I've worked on i think i, I i'm uh, i would make some changes in that but i'm very proud yeah that that's one for me and that's why i was super excited when i knew i was going to get the chance to talk with you uh that so that when that movie came out i think our town had gotten ireland's first 3d movie oh. theater yeah. And I went to see that movie 11 times. <laughs> I brought basically everybody that I knew. I love that. Like every time, every weekend I would be like, okay, you know, this group, we got to go. And then somebody else has got to go. And this person's got to go. And that person's got to go. And I actually went twice completely alone. And it really wow. felt, it was funny because every time I went, it was entirely sold out. And every time I went, it felt exactly like, and it's funny, I have a, I have a playlist on YouTube sometimes if I'm writing something or I'm doing something and I just let like old movie trailers and stuff like that play. And the, the trailer for that is the first video that I added to the playlist. The, uh, uh, the one, the one with the the dateline tag. Yes. (laughs) And it really felt like that. It was so weird because even when I look at it now, I kind of get chills and I'm like, that was exactly how that felt. At the time, I yeah. remember being in the theater and like the scenes with the f- uh, with the torch and and when he throws the axe at the windscreen of the, the truck and it, it felt so immersive. It was like I knew what yeah, 3D it, was, it but was, it was like, wow, this is next level. It was very much designed to that. And we had a, you know, it's uh, uh, Max Penner, our stereographer. So he designed a lot of the 3D cameras. Um, that we used so he would um you know how you have a focus puller who sits there Mm -hmm. and dials 
as soon as the shot is happening. So, oh, look, I'm focusing here. I'm focusing on your pretty head in the background. Yeah. Like that. Well, he would do the same with the 3D during the shot because we were shooting real 3D. So, so if you have one camera shooting down into a mirror uh, mm-hmm. and the other shooting through it. So he would literally adjust the depth of the 3D during each shot, as the, depending on where the actors were, which is why the 3D in that film is so good, um, uh, in my opinion. Uh, but it, it, it's, it, and, and we were you know, very actively wanting to make a fun movie. You know, yeah. We wanted to make a really fun scary movie that that yeah, that utilize the 3d not just to you know jab things in your face but also you know the mind was the perfect sort of environment for that you know uh, the 3d loves that sort of depth and those tunnels and things like that and, and then shooting in a real mine underground so it's you know the textures are all mm-hmm. there right in front of you and absolutely there's so many things about that film um, that we felt so lucky to, to be part of. As, as challenging as it was to make, um, it was an amazing experience. Yeah, it and um, it even holds up. I watched it recently again, um, just on Blu-ray, and e- even even without the treaty, treaty like yeah. little things still. Um, there's a scene where he breaks the lights as he's walking through the tunnel. And like yeah. it still kind of feels like I like I feel like those sparks are like on a different layer than yeah yeah it's 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 that, that uh, yeah I love that little sequence because it was you know that's a completely in camera gag it's just it's a shot of Jensen smashing the lights and it's a shot of uh, Chris Cornell who who passed away last year unfortunately who was a stunt performer for the minor. Um, he had watched Jensen's rhythm and then dressed as the minor, he did the exact same thing at the exact same angle. And we just flashed mm-hmm. them in, um, you know, just, it was all editorial. Uh, but, but yeah, I, I love that little sequence. How did, how did you become involved with, with that movie? I, uh, was, uh, brought on to recut, um, and essentially, uh, take over, uh, a film for Lionsgate called the eye. Yeah. Uh, with Jessica Alba, the the two French directors um, had ended up leaving the production. Um, uh, however, politically that happened, mm-hmm. um, and uh, and they had talked to me about. Uh, so I wrote like forty pages of reshoots, and we showed you know reshot you know for nine days uh, uh, with Jessica and. and uh, uh, and Alistair de Navallo and, and uh, Parker Posey and, and Rachel Ticketin and and um, uh, and then sort of changed the movie heavily. I mean, we shot and reshot a third of the movie. Um, and uh, one day, because that was a movie started as a Paramount film, and then Paramount had sold it to Lionsgate. Uh, part of the deal uh, that I think Mike Pasternak, Pasternak, one of the executive producers on Valentine, had wanted, he had worked on the original Valentine and had mm-hmm. always wanted to remake it. So I believe as part of that, hey, we'll take the eye off you if you give us Valentine. And the day the Valentine rights closed, was a day I walked into a, a screening room with Mike Pasternak and, and Peter Block and I think John Sackey. And one of them just turned to me and said, Hey, do you want to direct this, the remake of my bloody Valentine? I just said, yes. <laughs> um, and it was, it was literally being in the right place at the right time. Wow. I, I, physically, they hung up the phone as I walked in and was asked that. That's great. I mean, it worked out so well. I think. Yeah, um, no, I was I was incredibly grateful for it. But that that's that's how that happened. That's absolutely, and it, for me at the time, I remember kind of realizing that this was like maybe on a different level, because at the time, I guess here, um, I would say we were a little bit behind the states. We wouldn't get every horror movie, and even right. when we did, it wouldn't always really draw like a huge crowd you'd always have like you know the horror guys and maybe some people on dates but that that movie was slammed like every show on every night that's the first time i can remember 
in Ireland where I had went to a movie theater and uh, like if you had gotten there late, you would sit in the front row oh lo- looking <laughs> up at the screen. Wow. Um, wow. It's the, crazy. The was, be coming over your head. <laughs> <laughs> um, was there ever talk of a, of a sequel or... Oh yeah, oh yeah. We, we Todd uh, Farmer and I, uh, we have like forty pages of a scriptment. So that's half treatment, half script yeah. that we wrote uh, pretty quickly afterwards, uh, and took it into Mike Pasternak and John Sackey, and they were very intrigued by it. But they were told that Lionsgate post. We were very lucky to make Valentine at all. Um, okay. There was a mood at Lionsgate that that they were trying to get away from genre films. They felt Saw had sort of run its course, and so they wanted to. You know, they had done, they had just agreed to do the Ashton Kutcher movie Killers, you mm-hmm. know, which was a big sort of mainstream movie. They were doing the next three days with with uh, uh, Kevin Costner, um, so they were trying to get out of the genre. Okay. So. Um, if it wasn't for the fact that marketing, the marketing department agreed that they could sell the shit out of Valentine, we wouldn't have got to make it. You know, I, I remember being told by, by somebody high up at Lionsgate that uh, it is script. It's just, uh, it's just a blunt hammer to the face. Well, it's sort of a blunt hickaxe, pickaxe <laughs> to the face, but, but, uh, um, but it was you know, very, very sort of dismissive of it when we wanted to make it. Um, but, uh, Mike Pasternak very smartly got marketing on board with two things. Uh, the casting of Lewis, the dog, um, and Selena Luna, uh, 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 Tim Palin at, at, uh, Lionsgate marketing at the time was brilliant. Um, was, uh, um, uh, was a fan of Salinas. And, and I was told, you know, you, you, she's a, you know, uh, 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 a little person, uh, 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 burlesque actor, very funny, really mm-hmm. lovely. Can you put her in the movie? I said, absolutely. Can we kill her? And they were like, absolutely. Great. <laughs> She'll be in. We got a perfect part for her. It'll be really fun. And, um, and then, but you also have to put in, uh, this dog Lewis. And it's like, Okay, come meet Lewis. We have to see if Lewis likes you. So I went down, and the other head of marketing, uh, Sarah Greenberg, who's great and brilliant, and I think I think that don't think she does that anymore. Um, Lewis was her dog, and she was trying to sort of put her dog in the movies. So I met Lewis, and Lewis and I bonded. Lewis had his own chair at set. Oh wow! Uh, <laughs> uh, um, uh, and they were like, that's great. So, yeah, we can put Lewis in the movie. We won't kill Lewis. Uh, but we will we'll kill Selena. Um, and they and then marketing was on board. Suddenly they were like, yeah, absolutely. We'll back this movie uh, a thousand percent. And they, and they did. Told they, and they told everybody they could sell it. They And they did sell it. And, they, you know, they got a great ad campaign, great posters, great. Um, and it was but those two things are the reason that got, movie got made. That's so crazy. That, that they're the reason that, that when they kept thinking, I don't know if we really want to make this really sort of brutal horror movie, you know, in 3d and, and marketing was like 3d. Yes. We'll say a 3d horror movie that this will make money. Yeah. And that's why I'm surprised uh, when you had said that you guys kind of had something together for a sequel and it never happened because like, didn't the movie make like a hundred million dollars or something? It did. Yes, it made a fortune, and it made you know, uh, uh, it did, and they owned the movie entirely. So they, the Lionsgate didn't have any partners in the film; they pocketed all that money. So it was a yeah, yeah, yeah. We were we were a little surprised by that because, uh, and and every other year we'll go back to them. You know, Todd and I would go back and say. Uh, hey, you know, how about that Valentine's sequel? Uh, you know, I remember talking to Jensen and Kerr about it. They would have come back. We had a great opening sequence with 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 Jensen. Um, you know, as Tom, that would have been incredible. It all it all it starts with a. Uh, I'll I'll just tell it to you. What the hell? Um, it started with a a you know years afterwards. 
with a, a mining disaster. Mm-hmm. Uh, and uh, miners trap down below and there's a rescue mining team that comes in and they're like, okay, we can't get down. We can't. So it's news cameras, all this news footage. And uh, this one rescue miner, uh, basically like a spider finds this little hole to go down on this cable and go and go down and start getting people out. And it's Tom and he saves all these miners and he comes up and as he comes up he's trying to avoid the cameras and his gas mask comes off as he comes up and you see him on the news and then you cut to that news footage of of axel you know Kurt smith's character but that fucking guy he's still alive um and uh, then you cut to a bar and there's all these sort of, you know, local yokels and everything in the bar and Tom is there and uh, uh, it's like a mining bar. And somebody said, well, you know, you know, it's a tough, you didn't need to, you know, some of these uh, mining types are giving him the gears, you know, you, you we know, we didn't need you. We would have, you know, we don't need some outside guy coming, coming in and arresting you, blah, blah, blah. Um, and he's just like, Hey, I don't want any trouble. And he goes into the, into the bathroom and, and, uh, uh, this, uh, one of the, the sort of bully, uh, miners, uh, goes in after him and, and starts picking a fight with him and he won't fight and he punches him in the head and his head hits the mirror. And then the reflection in the mirror goes all Harry Ward. As he's looking at his own reflection, it's just I, I have all goosebumps Ward. right now. <laughs> it's all Harry Ward looking back at him, and he walks out of the bar and he walks past everybody. His blood's running down his head, and he's and he sees the 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 bar door, and he throws the bolt on the door and locks it. And then above the door is a pickaxe, and he grabs the pickaxe and he turns around and kills everybody. Um. Anyways, nobody wanted that, so we didn't make it. <laughs> but that would have been the open wow I, like i i genuinely can't under and like even now i feel like it would probably be more popular now well I, and i think i think jensen uh might do it right i think uh, oh, if we yeah. went back and i uh, you know jensen and, and kerr and jamie and, and eddie Gathegi, uh eddie uh, uh who was one of the cops, uh, Martin, he had a big part in it and a uh, much bigger part. And, you know, we, we, they had all agreed to come back when we talked about it. So. That's something that, yeah, and that, I know there's a lot of fans that would love to see that. Yeah. Well, anyway, that was the opening. So, <laughs> wow. That's, um, that Todd, uh, farmer and I cooked up. So, I, I, um, it actually blows my mind that after banking over a hundred million and coming in with just that opening scene that you would still be like, mm, no, maybe not. Yeah, yeah. I'd be like, well, I don't know. It just sounds like you're hitting us in the head. Yes, exactly. <laughs> it's, Frequently and often. And, and like the, <laughs> the franchise itself is still, I know Screen Factory just re, um, released a Steelbook version of the original. Yeah, and, um, yeah, which is great. Yeah, yeah, and they had done the figure and stuff and like it sold out like super quick. So the character is still. Oh, the, yeah, the character is yeah. great. Yeah, the, the, the minor character is, is is it's it's like evil Darth Vader. Not that Darth Vader's not evil, but you know what I mean. Yeah, uh, uh, it's it. You know the the is interesting. All the breathing for the character in in uh, uh, Valentine. Uh, we had different you know actors do it and you know, do a do a whole sort of breathing pass. Uh, but it ended up uh, being Steve Bodeker, our sound designer. Uh, said he recorded it in shorts in his bathrobe by putting a, a um, uh, empty uh, paper towel roll tube in the bottom of a of a like into a uh, beer pitcher and a microphone in the bottom of the beer pitcher watching the movie and he breathed into it and it performs the whole movie. So that's all the breathing of the mind. That's, <laughs> that's crazy. How that was done. Um. So so once that movie comes out and it's like super successful um was there a lot of offers on the table or was there something that you maybe were looking at thinking um you know it's interesting it wasn't a lot of offers a lot of people assume the movie's success had solely to do with the 3d that seemed to be what we got back a lot is it's like wow well, nothing to do with you guys it was all the and, and you know uh, i was like oh okay 
Um, we had a wrote a movie over at Dark Castle, which ended up with a rights issue, so that didn't happen. Um, a remake of uh, I Saw What You Did, I Know Who You Are, which is about mm-hmm. two uh, girls crank calling a, a killer. Uh, um, uh, and then, uh, but that ultimately didn't happen. Although it would have been pretty fun. We we pitched it as 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 uh, um. I can't remember. I can't remember how we pitched it, but it was uh, it was like three days of the Condor in high school. That's essentially what it was. Um, um, but anyway, doesn't matter. Uh, so many things don't happen. Um, yeah. And then uh, and then we we Todd and I were kicking around an idea, and that's when we wrote Drive Angry. We we uh, we thought we'd actually get to at that point we get to do a sequel to Valentine, and that's what we were sort of focused on. Um, uh, but we started writing Drive Angry while we were, while we were waiting for the call, uh, and everything. And, uh, Drive Angry was, uh, uh, we both were fans of old road movies, you know, mm-hmm. Race of the Devil, uh, uh, you know, uh, Crazy Larry, Dirty Mary, and, and, and stuff like that, which I probably got backwards, but, uh, um, uh, Vanishing Point. And just sort of thought, you know, a road movie in 3D could be pretty fun. Uh, and then we added a supernatural twist to it, and it's it sort of created this this driving 3D horror action mm-hmm. comedy <laughs> movie um, uh, called Drive Angry. So that's that's. And then you know Mike DeLuca came on board to produce it, um, and DeLuca did like Moneyball and, and Social Network and. And he was great, and and Millennium uh, financed the film, and uh, and got us Nicolas Cage, and uh, at the time, that uh, sort of just before Nick started, you know, doing as he calls the performance art of his of phase of his career. Yeah. Uh, but working with Nick was great. I loved working with Nick, and then we got William Fickner and Billy Burke, and and, and Amber Heard, and Kevin, uh, and rather. Uh, uh, Tom Atkins and uh, David Morse. So you know, it was a fun, fun cast. Yeah, and and that movie uh, I, again, that was one of those movies over here that done quite well, from what I could see, just you know, around here, and even like I said, um, a relatively small town. It was one of those movies that just seemed to be everybody talked about all the time um, at the time, and uh, from what I gather, it done quite good at the box office as well. It didn't do quite well by the box office. Uh, uh, it sort of uh, uh, it opened Oscar weekend of 2011. People sort of stayed away in droves. Um, you know, the the ad campaign gave a lot away, which was a little frustrating. I remember mm-hmm. uh, both uh, Todd and I and, and DeLuca uh, were all a little frustrated with Summit pictures at the time uh, before summit was bought by uh by landscape uh with with the promotion plan because it felt like it just told everything up front um and then uh you know it uh it has since found i think a larger audience yeah. i certainly have a lot of people talk to me particularly about bill fickner's character about how much they love that that and 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 the cage drinking the beer out of his enemy's skull <laughs> um which was a total nick cage invention he he came up with that line of dialogue he tweaked that in 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 the uh, uh the scene where he's uh, talking about you know what hell is like and because we hadn't shot the ending yet, I was just like, okay, you have to get us uh, a skull that Nick can drink from because we are going to shoot that. That has to be the end of the movie. So we re- rewrote the movie based on his speech uh, um, that he had tweaked. And, and sure enough, somebody drinking beer out of somebody's skull is uh, – there's not a lot of movies that do that. No, there's not. <laughs> um, yeah, because I, I had seen – I'm because uh, again, like a lot of stuff uh, online, uh, you're not really sure whether it's, you know, fact or fiction. I guess uh, that the mm. movie had made fifty, sixty million dollars in the box office, but then a lot of people say that it it um, no, cost fifty not million it. and all this uh, stuff. Yeah, that that's. 
the true budget, um, none of us will ever know. Uh, um, but it, it, that's the number that they said it cost. I believe it costs less than that. Uh-huh. Uh, um, I know the number that we physically made the movie for, and that is way less than that. Uh, but that's not including Nick's fee and things like that. Yeah. But the actual physical, physical production costs, I, I know that was more like 15. Okay. Uh, the, you know, the cost of what it was to actually uh, put everything on camera. Uh, Nick's fee was on top of that, which was still very high at that time. And there were other fees and producing fees and below, above the line. So so could it have could 50 have been spent in all those extra fees? Sure. Potentially, yeah. Um, is, is that what we had to make the movie? No. Yeah, I kind of, uh, I kind of imagined that. Yeah, yeah. It, it, it's funny, given the amount of overtime hours that we had to do on Valentine because we were, we were racing against Jensen's schedule because he had to be back on Supernatural. And any day that he was delayed cost us $200,000. So, so we had to make sure he was there on time. Mm -hmm. Um, uh, we actually shot more hours on Valentine than we shot on Drive Angry. Oh, wow. Drive Angry was shot in less time. Um, so, uh, yeah. Um, yeah. So I guess, yeah, well, that movie, that movie came out and like you said, maybe didn't do what it was intended and, and since has probably found its, its place, yeah, which I is good. People, you know, I, I think Nick is also having a bit of a renaissance, mm-hmm. uh, you know, with obviously Mandy and, 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 uh, he is a, there is no one like him. Yeah. Um, you know, he's, he's in a whole genre himself. Uh, in a great way. I loved working with him. He, you know, showed up uh, knowing every single line of dialogue uh, uh, for the whole, you know, that of his character for the whole script and had so many different ways to do it and so many different ideas and was highly directable and, and, and uh, uh, very enjoyable to work with. So, um, And from there, there was, a, there was a little bit of a gap then. And then you had... I'm right in saying you directed an episode of the Scream yeah, TV yeah. show. Yeah, I, 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 I co-wrote um, Terminator Genesis yeah. in that gap, which was uh, which was a a longer process. Uh, anyway, that's something else to talk about uh, at a different time. But uh, there are lots of things that I, I, I love about that film as well, and. Uh, and then wrote, uh, rather directed uh, uh, an episode of of, uh, of Screen, the TV series. I was originally asked to direct the pilot, but I couldn't do it because of my commitment to the to Terminator. Okay. Um, so um, then came back to do the the uh, uh, season two ender. Uh, mm-hmm. which is fun it was fun fun to get back into that yeah, yeah. that's what i was just going to ask how, how was the experience um shooting something like that after being involved in that original it was great you know it, yeah. it, it, it was a fun fun sort of like oh i i, I remember these and we and we talked about sort of tweaking things to 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 be well we did this in this movie and this and that movie let's maybe do a little of this a little of that so you know there's a lot of that going on yeah because uh, like you would yeah, be considered scream royalty <laughs> Yeah, well, I don't know about that, but it was it was very fun to be part of, uh, and a great New Orleans crew, and, and uh, you know, really enjoyable experience. Great TP, uh, Yaron Levy is really talented. And you also directed an episode of the Purge TV show. I did, yeah, yeah. Same DP, but I love that. The Purge was great. That was a that was one of the one of my favorite <laughs> directing experiences. It was this, it was. Lots of support um, from the production team and from Blumhouse and, and a great cast and, and a really fun script and mm-hmm. uh, yeah, such an out there concept. Yeah. Uh, you know, the purge is, well, not anymore. I mean, my God, it's like Tuesday in America. Um, I know, right? <laughs> yeah, it's just we're like, Ugh. yeah, it's, it, it's, it's definitely uh, uh, prophetic. Um, but yeah, it was a great experience. I loved it. I loved working on the purge. I, it was great producers and, 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 and it was just a, 
just a fun thing to do. We, you know, staged a, a firefight on a runway and, 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 uh, yeah, lots of crazy shit. Is, is TV directing or maybe a TV series, something that you would like to do yourself? Like sure. a complete... Yeah. Yeah. I've, I've certainly chased that and, and attached to that. Uh, a few years ago I was involved in a, a version of, uh, Frankenstein, um, at, uh, stars originally, and then mm-hmm. went to, uh, Amazon ultimately didn't get made, uh, after the, uh, uh, James McAvoy movie came out and didn't do so well. Uh, they just ought to make the series because uh, it was a period series and, and, and very different version of Frankenstein. Did you know Frankenstein was doing very different things in it? It was mm-hmm. really fun, but uh, uh, he was making monsters for Napoleon. Um, nice. Uh, so it was you know. Uh, Napoleonic super soldiers. <laughs> um, um, and then he was involved in a, a pilot for the Rifleman, uh, a remake of the Rifleman, which was a Western, which was really fun. And then Todd and I did uh, work on a couple other TV, TV things that didn't end up going. Um, uh, there's one other thing in there. I can't even remember what it is. Yeah. There's, there's a lot of it just sort of happens in you and you just keep, keep pushing forward. It's, um, the the universal monsters thing is is really strange to me how many times that's kind of tried to come back and mm. technically failed in a way it, it's very strange that those iconic characters seem to not be able to find their foot in. well it it it's i mean the the thing about you know obviously the, the universal monster i think other than the creature which they own all the others are public domain Right. Anybody can do an Invisible Man movie. Anybody mm-hmm. can do a Dracula movie. Anybody can do a Frankenstein movie. Uh, they're all just, you know, sign up. I think that's why Dracula is the most film character in cinematic history. Um, Might be correct there. Uh, uh, you know, because he's probably, uh, probably, you know, he's, he's a good public domain uh, character. Uh, um I, I must say, though, I, I loved uh, Lee Winnell's Invisible Man. Yeah, me too. I, I, I thought I thought I didn't care for the Tom Cruise mummy movie. Uh, I sort of felt, you know, in the plane sequence, the coffin on the plane and stuff like that. I was just like, hey, I've seen this film. <laughs> <laughs> um, hmm. Um, <laughs> But I, I loved uh, what Winnell did with it, so I'm excited to see what else Blumhouse does with those with those classic characters. Because I, I feel that that his version of Invisible Man with with uh, Elizabeth Moss was just mm-hmm. incredible. It was so smart and and scary and 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 lean and had none of those bloated ridiculous action scenes that never fucking end yeah uh you know no i thought it was great so i'm excited to see what what they do with the other ones yeah because i think he is in the talks to either do uh, the wolfman or dracula next i'm not sure i th- i think the wolfman i think i think uh, dracula is being uh done by somebody else i oh, okay. can't remember who it is but yeah yeah um yeah. so what was it he, two years ago the movie you released, the movie Trick. Yeah. yeah. That's another one. Uh, like I said, I, I'm a big slasher guy and it's another one that I was like super excited for. And then when it came out, it was one of those things where I I, I want to say that it didn't come out here at the same time. So I remember yeah, like, probably. yeah, I remember like scouring the internet trying to find this. And uh, eventually when I saw it, I, I still, uh, I still rewatch it like every couple of months. I just find that it's, it's a fun as a slasher fan. It's fun. It's fast paced. And it's very kind of like what you've said a couple of times in the conversation. It, it seemed very lean. There wasn't a lot of, um, we just got into it. It is very lean. Yeah. yeah. It, 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 it is. It is a very lean little movie. It was made for two and a half million dollars so it, it, it's you know shot in 20 days um it was a very quick uh, movie that we shot in, in extremely cold conditions in in newburgh uh, new york um 
But a, a wonderful little cast. It was great to have Omar back. You know, originally we were going to have Dermot Mulroney in that role because I'd worked with him on um, Into the Dark, uh, on an Into the Dark movie called Flesh and Blood. Um, but ultimately, uh, our schedule kept pushing and Dermot wasn't available. So I reached out to Omar, who I'd worked with and who was available. And, and Omar came uh, came to do it and was great. Uh, great fun to have him and and uh yeah and then we just wanted to make sort of a a, a vicious little uh, slasher movie that that uh you know had a had a bit of a different ending yeah I, like i really enjoy it and it's another one of those movies i think it's found its place and it has um its fan base when did you come up with the idea or what what inspired that concept um, uh, you know, we we had talked about wanting to do a, a slasher character that was younger and faster, mm-hmm. uh, wasn't a sort of a slow stalker. Yeah. Um, it was just brutally fast and vicious. That was something that we had talked about. And then um, the ending sort of came out. Uh, we did write a version that was sort of supernatural, and then we started looking at the material and going, you know, let's not go that way. And then Todd and I started kicking around and came up with the ending that's there, which we just thought was, um, had all sorts of different sort of commentary on it, but, but it was something that we were, uh, very, very excited by. That's an ending. I, I, I yeah. really like, uh, but it was, you know, it was a crazy shoot. That that opening party sequence was shot in eight hours. Uh, it was uh, Amanda Trey's the DP. She's brilliant. She did. A, she operated almost the whole film as well, and uh, you know, camera operated. And and uh, it was so fast. And Gary Tunnicliffe came back to do all the special effects mm-hmm. makeup. You know, he did Valentine and Drive Angry and Dracula Two Thousand and the two Dracula sequels and. And the and the and the cane makeup in in uh, White Noise too, and and uh, you know everybody was the cast was great. They never left set. We just raced, and it was a single camera that opening scene. We only had one camera, and just yeah, it was uh, you know you had to have your wits about you. Yeah, that, <laughs> it, it sounds like the process of making it was kind of how the audience felt watching it because it just. Yeah, it just starts. It's just true. like, <sighs> yeah, there is no fucking around. Uh, it's like, all right, here we go. Yeah, uh, no, I, I really like that though because at, at a time, I mean, two thousand and nineteen, we've at you know at that point we've had so many different versions of slashers and you know big budget, smaller budgets, and you kind of feel like you've seen everything, and it, it did yeah. feel like a little breath of fresh air where it was like, oh, thank God, it's not just the same thing yeah yeah we that that was that was part of a reaction yeah to doing that so you know we wanted that sort of uh component to it yeah um Um, uh, what are some of your favorite horror movies uh my my favorite horror movie and probably my favorite movie is uh the 78 uh invasion of the body snatchers nice uh, and also um, uh, the Changeling, the one with Joyce Scott. Mm-hmm. Uh, those two films, I I absolutely love. Um, I think they're so well done. Um, you know, Jaws, I think is brilliant. Mm-hmm. Uh, Alien and Aliens are brilliant. Um, yeah. Do you um? Do you have any? I always call them guilty pleasures, but somebody somebody told me they're called comfort movies. Do you have any movies that are maybe on paper not so good? But Twins you... of Evil. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Vampire Circus. Uh, uh, yeah, the whole Hammer library. Yeah. I quite, <laughs> yeah. quite love um, Hands of the Ripper. Uh, you know, any Christopher Lee horror movie, uh, I... especially Peter Cushing's in it. I think uh, I, um, I think that's part of maybe being a horror fan as well, though. We kind of, I mean, we, we kind of accept a lot of things with open arms and it's just yeah, fun. Like yeah. it's, it's fun. It's escapism. Yeah. And I mean, yeah. in a lot of ways, horror is just ridiculous to start with anyway. So 
I mean, I, well, it's, you know, I think it's, uh, Wes always had such, such a great philosophy about it. You know, horror is, is, it's a way to, to, to face all the, all the darkness in your life, uh, and come out the other side, you know, and survive. Um, that's what a horror film does. Yeah. And, and, says, and it's true. terrible things, but you're still alive at the end of it. Yeah. Yeah. Um, it's true. You know? Yeah, um, so I think I think they're very good that way. Yeah, and 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 that's probably why the community. I I've often thought about that. That I'm not sure if there's a community as um. I'm not sure how to explain it, but like they're so passionate. Um, they mm. will buy every piece of merchandise, regardless of how many different versions of a movie or figures. I oh mean, I God, do what I. I, I, I uh, uh, <laughs> I have so many versions of the thing. I have so many versions of, of, of like they live and all that. Yeah. Fuck. Yeah. Way too many. Yeah. Like <laughs> so for, I, I've got to have this. Yeah. <laughs> and, and it's such a, it's such a strange thing. Like e- even, um, bloody Valentine, um, mm. your one. I mean, I, I bought it, I think originally in the States on DVD and it came with the 3d glasses and yeah. I just never opened it because of that. So I just put that away. <laughs> and then when I went back, I bought the Blu-ray in the States. Then I came home, oh. I bought the Irish DVD and Blu-ray. Oh. And there's a guy on Instagram who transfers new movies onto VHS and makes a cover. Oh, that's great. And yeah, and he made one. Uh, I got one commission for My Bloody Valentine. And it's one of those things where I'm like, I don't care how many if it's all the same thing, but if it looks a bit but different or it feels a bit different, you have to collect it. Yeah. yeah. I, 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 I totally get that. Yeah. I totally get that. It, and it's nice to see uh, those things get recognition as well. When fans are so passionate that they're mm-hmm. willing to support those things. Yeah. Um, yeah. No, I love that. I, uh, that. That's a great thing. Yeah. Okay. So yeah, a few final questions then. Um, okay. let me see where am I at? Okay, so if you could write or direct um, either an installment, reboot, remake, whatever you want to call it, of any existing horror IP, uh, what would you choose and why? That's an interesting question. Write, reboot. God. Yeah, if you could be involved in it in any capacity, I guess, whether it be directed or write the story or both. Is there any character or any existing franchise that you would love to have a go at? There is, and I think I think I, I would have that answer uh, better prepared if I if, if you hadn't asked the question. <laughs> you know, <laughs> I think now that you've asked it, I have no idea. Um, you know, I I think. Uh, for for a while, I had tried to chase the doing a, a remake of the Changeling, and then then nice. I just rewatch it and I go, no, I don't, I don't, I don't think so. Um, uh, I I would love to continue uh, Invasion of the Body Snatchers, that would years cool. later, sort of thing, you know. Uh, Donald Sutherland's still around. Uh, um, uh, but yeah, you know, uh, I, I think there's so many great horror stories. I always wanted to do some sort of Lovecraftian nightmare, mm-hmm. uh, being a big fan of, of those stories growing up. Uh, um, uh, and yeah, I don't, I don't have, I'm sorry. I'm not giving you the, the no, exact, no, that's okay. I'm trying to do this. Um, you know what it is? I would love to remake Scanners. And do scanners nice. actually as a TV show? Oh, uh, yeah, that that's what I would love to do. That would be amazing. Uh, yeah, Todd and I talked about that for a while, and the rights kept sort of shifting around. But scanners, I think, is uh, is something. Uh, I love the Cronenberg original movie. I, I think Cronenberg's brilliant, and and I, I I wouldn't want to remake the movie, but I certainly think a TV show. Uh, yeah, um, it's in that world and that that whole sort of MK Ultra vibe mm-hmm. that 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 movie has, I think would be great. That would be a fun way as well to to reintroduce something to kind of the modern day audience, maybe. Yeah, yeah, and it's a great title and it's a it's a great concept. Yeah. Uh, um, did you ever have any 
interest in either writing or directing uh, Halloween, a Halloween movie. A lot of people talk about that online. Um, yeah, we Todd, Todd and I um, uh, were gonna. We were hired to do Halloween 3D, a, a mm-hmm. sequel to Zombies movie. So we yep. wrote it, and uh, we were five weeks away from shooting. Uh, Tyler Maine was coming back, um, uh, and uh, you know, uh, it, yeah, that would have been a really fun experience. You know, we talked to Eddie Kafegi about about being in it and being uh, uh, sort of the lead cop character, and um, it was a crazy little film. It, the scripts floating around, and uh, you know, out yeah. there in the world. Uh, uh, but yeah, yeah, that would have we would have we definitely wanted to do that, and then. And then, uh, you know, we had uh, talked about years before that of uh, doing different different versions. We talked about doing a, 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 somebody they wanted to do a different sort of reboot, remake, whatever. Oh, we talked about doing a version with like Sean Bean as as a as a Loomis character or Loomis himself, but but made it quite um, the whole opening felt like the end of the original Halloween with J.B. Lee yet uh, the house that sh- the shape goes into was a trap uh, I, don't, I can't remember it was there's so many ideas and the William Shatner one but who doesn't want to yeah. who doesn't want to see William Shatner in a, in a Halloween movie yeah because a lot of people still talk about that because I do know that that script is floating around somewhere and then obviously um there was a book that came out I'm not sure if it was last year, Taken Shape, and it runs through all yeah. the unmade. And a lot uh, of people talk about that all the time. And your name always gets brought up for like, you know, I wonder, is there another idea there? I wonder, I'm surprised Blumhouse didn't try and do. Yeah, I, you know, I, I, I feel that, you know, certainly Blumhouse uh, has done a great job of, of uh, sort of, uh, uh, in the choose your own adventure of, of Halloween movies, which there are several, yeah. um, you know, the, 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 the cult one with Paul Red, and, you know, go whichever way you want. But, uh, yeah, I, I think, I think they will probably exhausted for a while in a good way. You know, they, they have their, their two more movies still to come. Um, and then, uh, and then it, it, it may, uh, rest yeah, until for another while such time yeah uh, i certainly would uh personally uh, uh sign me up for the silver shamrock movie i would love to be part of that that would be amazing yeah a yeah. big fan and of following bring tree. tom atkins back i love tom atkins uh you know uh, dr chalice is still alive <laughs> <laughs> um kind of i guess on the on the same vein as that like you as i said before you were in the middle of that huge I guess late nineties, early two thousands, and then even some huge hits like with my Billy Valentine later. Um, you were right in the mix of all that, and your name was always involved in those huge projects for for the horror genre. Mm. Um, do you think that you know those kind of um, slasher esque movies that you've been involved with? Do you think they still have a place in mainstream, or have we kind of moved into a new? a new era, I guess. That's an interesting question. Um, sure. I think, I think it just takes, uh, I think people thought there was no home for any of those movies before scream came out. Yeah. Uh, it only takes one. I think, uh, the scream movie that's going to come out next year could, could very well, uh, reawaken, uh, that exact thing that, uh, you know, it's all cyclical. Mm-hmm. Uh, yeah, you know, I remember when people were like, "Oh, there's no room for those movies uh, now that we're doing all the J horror movies." You know, The Grudge, The Ring, The yeah. uh, The Eye, The One Missed Call, and you know, everything like that. And then suddenly, uh, you know, something else comes out, and it's like, "Oh, now we're doing all those those movies." You know, uh, so I, I think it only takes one, and everything changes. Yeah, yeah, that that is true, and I, 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 I guess it's just a case of somebody, um, because you'll you'll probably find everybody will jump onto it again when when someone finds the thing that resonates maybe with the younger crowd. 
that all the studios then all of a sudden go, hey, actually, you remember that My Bloody Valentine sequel? Yeah, well, and, and a, a lot of it, I think, I think the people who, who make them at the time have no idea that they're making something that's going to catch on with the younger people. Yeah. <laughs> uh, you know, that's going to catch, yeah. uh, to capture the zeitgeist of the moment. Um, I think the, 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 the most surefire way not to capture the zeitgeist is to look for it. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. <laughs> um, you, you know, everything sneaks up on you. It's like love when you least expect it. Yeah, that's true. Yeah. Someone once told me that the secret to finding is to stop searching. Yeah. That's, Which, I think yeah. that's very true. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Obviously, now we have things like Shudder, you've got Netflix, Amazon, all those things. And then with this pandemic, I mean, theatres have been closed all over the world. I personally feel like that once things maybe, you know, everything, I won't say it goes back to normal, but we start to kind of maybe go more towards the positive than the negative. I feel like movie theatres will bounce back huge, but a lot of people seem to think that it's... could potentially go the other way and we won't see that yeah i don't know to be honest i i I could argue it either way yeah Uh, i could argue that 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 it won't bounce back and then and then i think the longer it's going to take everybody to get vaccinated you know eventually i think we're right around the corner from from that you know certainly the end of the year um most of the world should have Mm -hmm. Uh, have been vaccinated. Um, I think the U.S. will probably be vaccinated very quickly based on what we're hearing. Yeah. Um, you know, um, uh, And then it'll be interesting to see. It'll be interesting to see what, you know, if, if there's enough movies, you know, is it going to be James Bond or, or Black Widow or what are, what's going to be the thing that, that gets people to back into the theaters it's uh during the pandemic it certainly wasn't tenant yeah. uh, uh you know which went, went yeah and that's not, nothing against the film it just is just like yeah you're gonna go see that movie nah, i don't yeah. think so i i yeah yeah it looks cool but it doesn't look cool enough yeah to, for me to do that yeah um but you know the, the more jabs people get the more uh, you know dunes might be the one i don't know yeah it it will be interesting to see and like i i've always been a a physical media um experience of going to the theater kind of person Mm. so it pains me when somebody says you know streaming is going to take over and they're going to have no choice and whatever i do however feel like that people will realize maybe now with all these lockdowns and restrictions that going to see a movie was a lot more than just watching a movie like on your TV. Mm. It was the experience of, I mean, everybody pays for the overpriced candy and the popcorn and everything. It's just part of the experience, I guess. Well, that, that, you know, um, when Wes Craven passed away, his memorial service was held at the DGA in their big theater there Mm -hmm. because that to him was like his church, that Mm -hmm. the idea of uh, not, that specific but the whole experience of making movies that was the religion that he was part of so it is that experience right that's that's it it is very much on par uh for for being something that has can have meaning and resonance and and where you can have a variety of different things so yeah I, i i i get that i get both sides of the argument i think time will tell yeah yeah um do you have a favorite memory throughout your career is there anything i know it's probably like asking somebody to pick between their kids is there anything or is there a handful of things that stick out to you working on a certain project i know you had said working on the purge was quite fun yeah working on the purge was great Uh, you know i think there's been a lot of great highlights memories and experiences you know that that they're, they're too numerous to count um you know i've been incredibly fortunate yeah. to to work in the film industry which is something that i was you know incredibly passionate about and and, and to find my way into it and uh you know it, i'm sure a lot of it is is little things um mm-hmm. uh that you know 
riding in an elevator with with, with Wes Craven after you know one of the one of the screen previews. That, mm-hmm. You know that was just and barely said anything, but it was just a feeling of well, we didn't suck today, so <laughs> <laughs> you know, um, you know, uh, there's this just it's so many of the things are the smaller moments. Yeah, um, you yeah. know. Um, uh, the thing I always love and about working at it is is the camaraderie of of all the people who who get together to make collective art, mm-hmm. right? Um, um, it's always an uphill shit fight um, that you will never trade for anything uh, because there's something about the the passion of and the and the fury of it all that's pretty pretty wonderful. Yeah, and. It um, it, it's one of those things as well. It it must be a, I mean, and maybe it's not something you really think about, I guess. But the the impact and the effect that you know projects that you have worked on or created have on people's lives, even just day to day, like the amount of just for me personally, there's so many many movies, for example, that say you've been involved with that I would consider like a crutch for maybe getting out of a bad spot or escaping from the world. And I know for a fact that there is like so many people across the world that use, and I don't want to say use as in like a bad thing, like a drug, but um, horror or these kinds of movies are there. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, And it kind of makes everything maybe not so bad. That must be a, um, a kind of a strange feeling that that, that will live on like that. That's, that's set in stone and that won't go away. It's yeah. I think for, for anyone who's a, who's a storyteller or, or, or works in the arts, the idea that that what you have created can touch somebody and, and and offer them solace in whatever form that is, uh, is pretty amazing. And, 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 and is also, may make you feel like you <laughs> like like you have more responsibility than than oh my god i'm just trying to get another job and, yeah. <laughs> yeah. and then you realize oh but it's but there's more to it than that and so it it's 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 something for myself i i don't necessarily dwell on mm-hmm. because it 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 feels like it can't actually be true. You yeah, know, I guess it's like, that. well, I can't actually have, you know, I, the movie, it's, it's, come on. Yeah. Um, but then at the same time, I think of the things that, that, you know, the movies that, and the stories that, uh, you know, there's a great line from a Jimmy Buffett song, which talks about, you know, putting the book on your, on the shelf with your heart in it. And it's it's the same, right? It's, mm-hmm. it's it's something that touches you so deeply, or moves you, or has a resonance, or has an experience that hits you or hits your core. Uh, so that uh, that's so much about you know once once it's made, it no longer belongs to me. It belongs to everybody who wants it to experience it. Yeah, yeah. And, and and it's an honor that people people take comfort from. Did um I hear a lot of people talking about it and asking um about things like imposter syndrome. Did you ever uh, maybe feel anything like that or uh uh uh, I don't wow, know, like it's like a therapy section, Jesus. But like an anxiety, yeah, maybe. Maybe like an anxiety about. Um, oh fuck! Every day, yeah, what like a, yeah, every day, every day. That's because a lot of people. Uh, that was a question I had gotten a lot. A lot of people were asking me, you know, um, could you ask advice for maybe following a dream that's not? I don't want to work a nine to five. I want to do. Every day you wait for somebody to discover the truth that you have no fucking clue what you're doing. <laughs> that, that, that every day, the most important thing is, is, to, is to just keep doing it. And if you want it bad enough, you'll get it. And be kind. Be, more, be kind more often than you're a dick. Um, and, and be gracious and be grateful and, and thank everybody 
you come across uh, because the, it's an amazing journey, but it's one you're lucky to be on. Yeah. And uh, whatever it is you're doing, just just don't be a jerk. Be kind. No, you heard it here first. Biggest advice. <laughs> For all the jerks out there. Yeah. Yeah, you know who you are. <laughs> um, okay, so two final things. Is, oh my god! We were at two final things. Well, I know. Dude. Yeah, I know. <laughs> Do you? I am assuming you have projects in the works. Is there anything mm-hmm. that you can talk about, or are we still kind of in the? I, th- I think there's there's nothing that I want to talk about yet. Mm-hmm. You know, it's that old paranoid superstition thing. But I but I, I do have a couple things. One with the uh, producer Adam Hendricks, who do, who who. Um, uh, was one of the producers on Freaky and and uh, Black Christmas, the yeah. third Black Christmas movie. Uh, but uh, Adam uh, did uh, into the in, produced the Into the Dark movie that I made with with Dermot Mulroney. And um, anyway, we have something cooking that I'm incredibly passionate about, and it's been a it's been a something I've wanted to make for thirty years. So oh, I'm hoping nice. it happens. Yeah. It's and it's one of those things as well. Um, I think you're at the level now where nobody really needs to check um a certain place once an announcement is made with your name i think it tends to be everywhere um, <laughs> i guess yeah, yeah I guess. It, it does it does um yeah. okay so final question then would be why horror and what does what does horror mean to you um horror is is to me is you know, so, so much of life is fraught with fear, right? Mm -hmm. So, so much of life is just terrifying. You're terrified that the the house you're going to be in is going to burn down or terrified of the neighbor or your parents or, or whatever. And, and, um, uh, I think, I think horror is a way to, to, stand up against the things that terrify you um the real things uh via your imagination via storytelling i think horror is probably one of the oldest forms of storytelling the oldest genre of stories mm-hmm. ever told we're afraid of the dark so we sit at the campfire yeah. and we imagine what's in the dark and what's going to come and kill us I, 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 they're cautionary tales they're tales of redemption they're tales of 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 finding the light, the darkness, there's tales of succumbing to the darkness. Um, I think the genre is, 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 uh, like, uh, Beauty and the Beast is old as time. Uh, um, but I think it's, is, it is that I think it's yeah. primal. I think it's part of who we are from when we were drawing in the inside of caves that this monster will fucking eat you. Um, it, it it's it, we're hardwired for it yeah and i guess that's why when i suppose the community is so diehard and then um when something strikes a nerve it it becomes so popular in the mainstream in the zeitgeist because people i i guess maybe even people who don't realize can relate more than they think yeah yeah because yeah. because because you know we're we we hopefully all get to to know love in our life. We certainly have all known fear. Yeah, yeah, that's true. So, okay, well, that's a a good note to end it on. Nice and happy. <laughs> all right. <laughs> um, I yeah. appreciate you taking yeah. the time. It's genuinely been an honor to talk to you. Wow, well, um, it's been a great time. Right. It's Thank you. Uh, this this is something that I, I kind of halfway through the conversation i kind of felt like that was like is this real this can't be happening um (laughs) so i appreciate you taking the time um for anybody listening we will keep a lookout for everything you're going to do in the future well thank you very much and i wish you all the best yeah i wish you too all right thank you Support First Class Horror on Patreon for as little as $1. Can't get enough of the horror? Carve yourself a deal from official merchandise only on Teespring. Join us on all social media at First Class Horror. We have such sights to show you.